This week in gaming with Naomi Kyle. Happy Solar Eclipse, my little Ecliptomaniacs. I'm Naomi Kyle, and welcome back to This Week in Gaming. This week, we're catching up on the 3DS and Wii U going offline for good, the importance of video game preservation, the current state of KOTOR, Knights of the Old Republic, and June Boom. What is that exactly? We'll get to that later. We've got all of this week's gaming news, so let's get started. Larian Studios, the popular game dev behind Baldur's Gate 3, was trending again this week for having some bold statements regarding the ongoing issues facing the games industry, and we love to see it. In an interview with GameFile, publishing director Michael Dowes had a lot to say about the recent wave of industry layoffs, saying, and I quote, the layoffs are an avoidable expletive, adding, that's all they really are. That's why you see one after the other, because companies are going, well, finally, now we can too. We've wanted to do it for ages, everyone else's, so why don't we? He went on to assert that in his words, none of these companies are at risk of going bankrupt, they're just at risk of pissing off the shareholders. Still, Dow's acknowledged the potential financial benefits of Larian Studios going public, saying creating the games that we wanted to make going public might give us more money, but it would be antithetical to the quality part of what we're trying to do, adding that it wouldn't make our games better, it would just make us rushed. This level of authenticity is so refreshing to hear. Larian, keep crafting games with this approach, keep speaking up and stay true to your vision. We're 100% behind you. In an email sent to Xbox staff, President Sarah Bond has confirmed that Xbox has formed a new team dedicated to game preservation. She mentioned that part of their plan is to preserve games by future-proofing the Xbox's digital library. Though it is unclear what that might look like, considering that Xbox is taking measures to future-proof their library, is no doubt a step in the right direction. Perhaps Xbox will have more to share about their preservation initiative during their showcase in June. Speaking of which, as we've mentioned in passing, Summer Games Fest will be this year's big gaming celebration event taking place on June 7th. And now we have news on some of the surrounding events that will coincide with Jeff Keighley's gaming extravaganza. Starting off big with the Xbox showcase, according to a new report from The Verge, the highly anticipated showcase is scheduled for Sunday, June 9th, and probably Promising some big announcements. It's speculated we'll be getting release dates for the next Call of Duty game, Avowed, Indiana Jones in the Great Circle, and Microsoft Flight Simulator. But the biggest news is looking to be the announcement of the next Gears of War game, aka Gears 6. Yep, while Microsoft has yet to confirm both the sequels and the showcase itself, sources suggest that plans are underway for a pretty big summer presentation from Xbox, and we're ready for it. As for what Ubisoft will be up to, we have the official details as the studio announced their Ubisoft Forward event will be returning on Monday, June 10th. Although Ubisoft kept their lips tight about what to expect at their presentation, we do know they have quite the lineup of upcoming and in-development games. Namely, Star Wars Outlaws, Assassin's Creed Codename Red and Codename Hexe, Xbox Defiant, and The Division Heartland. So hopefully we'll hear more about these titles at their showcase and maybe news of a new Splinter Cell remake? Rumors started swirling about the Splinter Cell remake when Ubisoft Toronto made a subtle change to its social media profiles by decorating them with Sam Fisher's iconic night vision goggles just ahead of their showcase announcement. So while this isn't concrete evidence by any means, it has my hopes up that we'll be hearing more about the remake since we haven't heard hardly anything since its announcement way back in December of 2021. Suffice it to say, we have a lot to look forward to in the first half of June this year, folks. So mark your calendars. It's on ours, and we've titled it June Boom. It just has a nice ring to it. Stop Killing Games is the latest movement created by YouTuber Ross Scott. As you'd probably guess from their name, Stop Killing Games is asking developers to stop taking their games offline when they feel a game has run its course. Scott and many others believe that video games are goods, not services. And preferred terminology aside, a good that you've purchased shouldn't be rendered inoperable by a seller after purchase. Gamers who feel so strongly about these games aren't asking devs to keep games operational forever. Instead, they suggest that when a developer feels a game has run its course, that they should come up with a solution so players who love their game can continue to play for years to come. This is not a new idea either, as there have been plenty of examples with games like City of Heroes and Knockout City that operate on fan-run servers. We'll dive deeper into this ongoing discussion with our guests this week a little later on in the show, so stay tuned. 
Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic remake has been as mysterious as a Jedi's secrets since its big reveal in 2021, but in a recent interview with IGN, Saber Interactive CEO Matthew Karch provided a much-needed update on the game. Despite its tumultuous journey, the KOTOR remake is alive and well and is still in active development under Saber Interactive, Karch confirmed, but refrained from divulging further details beyond that. The game's progress has been marred by delays and changes in development teams over the years, with Embracer CEO Lars Wingfurs hinting that its release may still be far, far away. At least we know KOTOR is safe and on its way at some point in the future. It is no coincidence that the eclipse marks a dark day for Nintendo fans across the globe. As of earlier this afternoon at 4 p.m., 3DS and Wii U owners can no longer enjoy online services. As announced by Nintendo earlier this year, Nintendo will be pulling all online support for 3DS and Wii U consoles. This includes online rankings, competitive, and cooperative play. The only exceptions to the shutdown include Pokemon Bank and Pokemon Transporter, which are both still supported by Pokemon Home. After today, April 8th, users can still expect to update their 3DS and Wii U games or re-download purchase software from the eShop. Nintendo has also mentioned that Street Pass, the feature on the 3DS that lets users share their Miis with one another, will still be available as it uses local connection to allow communication between 3DSs. Nintendo fans everywhere believe this change of the guard could possibly mark the coming of Nintendo's next device, which many have dubbed the Switch 2 or Switch Pro. What do you think? Has the time come for Nintendo to reveal their next console, or does the Switch still have a bit more life left in it? Let me know what you guys think and tag me on social at Naomi Kyle. The final cast update for the Among Us animated TV show adaptation is here. And this time, CBS Studios has revealed four actors for what we believe to be the third and final wave of reveals. The multi-talented Deborah Wilson, who has already lent her voice to several video games like Metal Gear Solid and Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League, will be voicing Yellow. Yellow is one of two of the ship's cooks, and she is said to be a prankster and is best friends with the ship's other cook, Brown. Brown is voiced by none other than the legendary voice actor Phil Lamar, who has voiced over 250 characters in his career. Listeners may recognize his voice from iconic shows like Futurama, Justice League, and Samurai Jack. Lime, the ship's engineer, is to be played by Wayne Knight, who starred in Seinfeld and Jurassic Park. Lime's main tasks are to, quote, get stuff pretty much mostly fixed-ish. Lime is also a conspiracy theorist and a doomsday prepper, which, as it turns out, might be a pretty good quality to have if things aboard the scaled shakeout how we might normally expect from the Among Us crew, so long as he stays clear of the vents. And finally, White will be voiced by Earth's nerdiest nerd, Patton Oswalt. Patton has starred in Marvel's MODOK, Minecraft Story Mode, and of course, Ratatouille. White seems to serve no role amongst the crew, since the only reason he is aboard the ship in the first place is because he won a contest. His good fortune is no doubt due in part to his wealth, which he believes can be a personality trait. If you're wealthy enough, which he is. This latest news from CBS Studios is very exciting. A cast of this caliber can choose to work on any project they like. So for them to agree to be cast in a TV show about multicolored space beans clumsily bumping into each other can only mean the show's script could be even better than expected. I'm so hyped for the show's release. Here's hoping that news of when we can expect the show to air isn't far away. So that's it for the news this week. It's now time to chat with our guest this week, Paris Lilly, who joins us to chat about game preservation and next-gen hopes and dreams. Paris, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're uh, excited to dive into this topic. It's kind of an evergreen topic. We've seen this a lot in the industry being talked about, but especially this week, for some reason, it's really in the news. Um, it's pretty prevalent. Uh, but yeah, game preservation, I want to talk about that. You know, keeping games online, online games that have been around for decades, um, or at least a decade, you know, some of them are going offline. Devs decide that, you know, they're no longer worth keeping around. Um, do you think in this topic of discussion that de developers should keep games alive? Like, is there an obligation to the consumer at that point? It's, it's a twofold answer. Yes and no. Yes. In the sense, when we talk single player experience games, games that aren't, I guess the lack of a better term, live service 
I think there, there should be some obligation there to, to preserve those games and to keep them alive. It does get tricky with live service games, though. When, when I think of something like Fortnite, let's just take that as the example. That's going to be trickier. If Epic all of a sudden decided they didn't want to do Fortnite anymore, how do you realistically keep that game alive? Because we have to remember there is a cost associated with those type of games to run those servers, maintenance, things like that. So that's where you kind of, uh, I can kind of understand that if at a certain point, a live service game reaches its end point, end of life, people are just simply not playing it anymore. It's going to be very hard to keep that alive at no cost. There, someone's going to have to fund uh, that that server maintenance. Now, when I think of something like a let's just say a Halo or a Call of Duty, where you can have serve, you could have some private servers that you could stand up. So maybe in those type of scenarios, a developer could basically hand those tools off to the community, and then the community themselves can basically flip the bill to uh, have those private servers, have those matches, things like that. So. Yeah, it, like I said, it's a little tricky where I, I, I see one side of it, like I said, for single player and just kind of the standard multiplayer games. But for the live service games like like Fortnite, it gets a little tricky there. Yeah, and we might, I mean, I don't think Fortnite's going <laughs> anywhere, right. but it's a good example, right. too, to base it off of. Uh, YouTube Ross Scott, he's the one, uh, he's a YouTuber, is looking to rally up opposition. He wants to take this to court or, you know, in some sort of legal capacity, try to fight this. Uh, do you think there's something viable there? Do you think there's potential that this can get any sort of uh, response from a governmental body? I think it's going to be very tough for everything that I just said. Whereas who's who's flipping the bill on this? Someone yeah. has to fund this. So if a game has reached its shelf life and it's just not monetarily profitable anymore. A, a government can't force a company to keep something alive and, and take it at a loss, especially if the population of that game is extremely low. So I, I understand the effort of it. And I think it does, if anything, it just brings more awareness to it. But ultimately, I, I can't see a government body forcing a company right. to, to keep a video game alive. Right. I guess it goes down to the question of, you know, consumer rights. That was kind yep. of the, mm -hmm. the the quote that was taken was, you know, is this an assault on consumer rights and preservation of media? Um, you know, I do think that when people purchase a game, it should be made more clear, perhaps, that, you know, right. you're purchasing a license. You're not purchasing the game in full to own. Um, what is your opinion on that kind of approach to selling games and the digital age that we're in? Man, if, I think you just said it. If we're in a digital age. I think we're 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 going into somewhat uncharted territory. And taking this out of games for just a second, and looking more on the entertainment side, where we, we're seeing um, a, a Warner Brothers or a Disney with these digital, these streaming platforms, if they just decide, well, this television show or movie is no longer available, it's yeah, gone. You, you it. have no way to be able to access it anymore. So. What's the, the consumer rights on things like that? And then when you translate that into games in the past, the games would be on a disc or on a cartridge. And OK, as long as I still have the old hardware around and it's working, I can put that disc in, I can put that cartridge in and I can still access that game and be able to play it. Maybe certain features or things like that, if it was Internet enabled, may no longer be available, but the core base game is still available to me. But now that we're starting to talk digital, and there's licensing and you got to authenticate with the server to say that you own that digital license. If that goes away, what do you have? What, what do you do? What are your rights on that? What obligation does the, um, the, the video game company, the publisher, the hardware owner have to be able to at least allow you to still access that game offline if it's a digital, a digital game with a, or a license? So. I don't know. I, I, I think we've, we've for sure seen uh, this be a hot topic. And I know we've seen Xbox somewhat uh, start talking about, you know, game preservation and digital licenses yeah. and mm -hmm. what what truly is ownership of a game these days versus your, for lack of a better term, almost long term renting a game when, when, when you purchase it these days. So as we go into the next generation and, and we're going to truly start to see just we're going all digital, it's going to happen. It's inevitable. So 
if it's the next gaming generation or the one after, there's going to be a time where they're no longer making physical games. And at mm-hmm. that point, where do we stand as a consumer for for what we can expect for rights? Do I own that license of that game forever? Or is there a shelf life to it? What What is the case? So there's still some questions that need to be answered. And like you had mentioned uh, previously, it's like, you know, there could be setups where they pass it on to a private server of some kind right. and someone there maintains it. But yeah, on the topic of next generation consoles... Um, Uh, We did mention Xbox is putting a huge focus here on backwards compatibility and game preservation. Quickly, I want to educate the audience. And for those who don't know, what is backwards compatibility? Can you just explain it as concisely as you can? (laughs) Yeah, backwards compatibility, to just think of it this way. Let's say uh, the Xbox 360. I bought a game on the Xbox 360 and we've now moved on to the Xbox One. Can I still play that Xbox 360 game on the Xbox One. That is, in simple terms, what backwards compatibility is. So when we think about games that we purchased on a previous console 10 years ago, will I be able to play it on the new console that I have in my home now? We've seen various iterations of this over the years, depending on on the hardware platform that we're talking about, where it's been somewhat, and I, that's why I specifically brought up the Xbox One, because Xbox had an initiative back in the 2010s with backwards compatibility, and we're starting to support it, and then they've translated that over here to the Series X and the S, but it's still not 100% percent. And I think that's the big thing. I want assurance that my entire library of games are going to follow me no matter the platform or, or like I say, the, the new generation of hardware uh, that may be there. So what, what happened here in recent news, it seems that Xbox is actually standing up their, their own internal team to look at game preservation and look at what they called it forward compatibility so that when they go to the next version of the Xbox and you're, we're, again, we're talking these digital libraries as we're buying these games, they're still going to be playable on that next next generation of hardware. I don't have to keep my Xbox Series X or S to continue to play those games because they will be compatible on the new hardware. When Xbox came out with this news, it was it was uh, it's good. It's good for fans. Yeah. It's good for the uh, the consumer um, to see that they're really honing in on that. And like you said, standing up a whole team. I mean, that yeah. sounds reassuring to me. On the next generation of consoles, do you per- in particular have any hopes, dreams, things that you're looking to see? Maybe some innovation or any ideas <laughs> that you're hoping to see in the next generation, or you're just hoping for a better working machine? <laughs> like it could be um, as simple as that. <laughs> all the above. No, I think one thing that is that has been a hot topic here in the last few weeks has been uh, handheld. Um, I think Nintendo has shown us with the Nintendo Switch that there is a market for these these hybrid handheld consoles that can play basically the, the AAA games that we're used to playing, you know, on a console at home. So I would love to see Xbox and, and PlayStation as we go into the next generation of gaming, kind of emulate what Nintendo has already started and have these hybrid consoles that I, I can take the experience on the go with me wherever I want to play it. But then I, I can also bring it home, dock it to my television and have that in-home console experience at the same time. That would probably be the Biggest thing I would hope to see as we go into the next generation, we know Xbox has already stated they're looking to have the biggest technical leap going mm-hmm. into the next generation. Right. What does that mean from a, uh, from a visual standpoint? What does that mean from an audio standpoint? I mean, what does it mean from a power consumption efficiency standpoint? There's a lot of different things I, I, I could think about when we, we talk about what is a big technical leap. Are we going to get to a point where these home consoles can compete with these high-end gaming PCs that cost a lot more uh, <laughs> than, than consoles do? I, you know, AI is obviously going to factor into this as well. Cloud compute, things like that. So it will be interesting to see what Xbox's vision is for their next generation console and then even PlayStation as well when, whenever they decide to start talking about the PlayStation 6. I'm right there with you about the handheld. I think that would be really cool to oh, see yeah. Xbox diving into that because they really haven't. So <laughs> No, they have not. They're the only ones. So I would love to see something like that. All right. Thank you so much, Paris. Always such a pleasure hearing your thoughts on everything going on in the games world. Yeah, thank you for having me. Paris Lilly is a host and creator of Kind of Funny and Gamer Tag Radio. You can follow him at Vicious696. Now, before I leave you, let's go over the video games releasing this week. Tomorrow, April 9th, there are two games coming out. First is Devolver's latest game, Children of the Sun, a sniper strategy game that lets you manipulate the trajectory of your bullet across multiple targets. 
Children of the Sun releases exclusively to PC. Then the third-person strategy shooter Gigantic Rampage Edition comes back to the realm of the living and relaunches on PS4, PS5, Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, and PC. And it even promises to support cross-play across all platforms. On Wednesday, April 10th, Broken Roads, the turn-based strategy game set in a post-apocalyptic Australia, debuts on PS4, PS5, Xbox Series X and S, Switch, and PC. Next up, the House Flipping Simulator, House Flipper 2, launches on PS5 and Xbox Series X. The rest of the games that are coming out this week are exclusive to PC, so I'll just go down the list. The stealth-based action platformer Airband Shadow Legacy releases on April 10th. Yet another fantasy title, looks like a mashup between Diablo and classic GTA with police and all. It comes out April 10th. Just in time for the new TV series, Fallout Special Anthology includes Fallout, Fallout 2, Fallout Tactics, Fallout 3, New Vegas, Fallout 4, and Fallout 76, and is available April 11th. And finally, Infection Free Zone, the real-time strategy-based builder set during the zombie apocalypse, releases on April 11th. Game Pass has two games coming out tomorrow. Kona the Mystery Adventure Survival Game returns to Game Pass April 9th. The Cozy Plant Puzzler Botany Manor gets a day one release on Game Pass April 9th. And be on the lookout for Shadow of the Tomb Raider Definitive Edition, which includes all seven DLCs on Game Pass Thursday, April 11th. The Epic Games Store currently has two free games available right now. Outer Worlds Spacer's Choice Edition, and Thief. But be quick because this deal is only available from now until Thursday, April 11th. And for those of us that have an Amazon Prime subscription, you can look forward to downloading free games starting every Thursday through the month of April at primegaming.com. On April 4th, we got Chivalry 2, Far Away 2 Jungle Escape, and the MMORPG Black Desert. Then this Thursday, April 11th, we'll be getting Drawn Trail of Shadows, Far Away 3 Arctic Escape, and Fallout 76. And that's This Week in Gaming. I'm your host, Naomi Kyle, and I had the greatest time this week bringing you all the latest in games. Thank you so much for listening. Your listen makes a huge difference. Don't forget to let me know what you're playing and what you think about these stories by tagging me at Naomi Kyle on social. From all of us here at This Week in Gaming, we wish you a fun-filled week. Talk to you later. Thanks for listening. This Week in Gaming is an iHeartRadio Canada podcast. Subscribe to this podcast on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts. Download the iHeartRadio app for more podcasts just like these.